It's time to take your seat in the front row with Mike Vaccaro. Here's your host, Mike Vaccaro. Hey, thank you, Chuck, and welcome, everybody. Mike Vaccaro here once again in the front row. As always, behind the scenes, it's JR Quitman, our creator, producer, and director. It's sports and cinema yet again. Last week, we had Jim Morris from The Rookie, the movie that talked about his life, the oldest Major League Baseball player. This week, it's Invincible, Vince Papali. He is the guy who his story was told in the movie Invincible, starring Mark Wahlberg. Talks about him being the oldest rookie in the NFL. What an incredible story from a season ticket holder of the Philadelphia Eagles to a member of the Eagles and so much more for his story to talk about. We get into that with him. Vince Papali, our guest in episode number 32 of In the Front Row. Well, Vince, first of all, this is a, a treat for us. and we, we, we can't thank you enough for joining us here. And uh, I know you're a busy man. You do a lot of speaking these days. But uh, take a little time out of your schedule to join us. And, and certainly we appreciate it. Well, I appreciate being with you. This is pretty cool. You know, I'm, I'm down in Wilmington. I'm, I'm in Jupiter, Florida, so a little bit a little bit south there than you, but uh, I spent a lot of time in Wilmington, North Carolina, especially with my boy, Roman Gabriel. Well, let's talk about you and where you grew up, though. Like you said, you spent some time here in Wilmington, but you're you're a Philly guy. Uh, you grew up just outside of Philadelphia. Right. What was life like for you early on growing up there, and and, and how much were, were sports part of your life early on? Well, uh, sports was my release. Sports was my getaway, you know, from uh, from where I was, where I grew up, and what I was doing, and the things that were going on in my home. And uh, it, it was always a, it was always the fabric of the house. If I if I had a picture to show you, uh, my mom was a, was a great athlete. She actually played professional uh, baseball back in the '30s, up and down the East Coast before World War II. For those of you who don't know when the '30s were, <laughs> and my dad was a semi-pro football player and a, and a semi-pro baseball player. Uh, both one of nine, and uh, but neither one of them got beyond the eighth grade because of the Great Depression, and you know they had to actually go to work, you know, to support the family and feed the family. And I uh, grew up in a housing project, which was really cool, actually. And what it was, it was it was a golf course. And uh, during during the war, they built these houses. We called it Cinder Block City. These Cinder Block houses, and uh, we built these really cool ha- housing complex in a big circle. And it, there's a lot of developments I know that you, ha- you would have in Wilmington that I have right down here. Like, for example, I live in a, in a golf community called T- uh, Turtle Creek down here in Jupiter, Florida. And, and it's basically a circle. And on the inside of the circle is a golf course. Um, but what we did is we built that circle, but there was no golf course. There was just a couple of fairways and it was just a, a, and a creek. We didn't have a creek because we had creeks back then, you know. But then I used to pole vault across and there's a story behind that. So keep that in the back of your mind. So, uh, you know, so we had the crick and uh, all the kids because we're all boomers, you know, we're boomer babies. And our fathers, uh, if they weren't at the war, um, they were working on on the Delaware River in the plants, you know, the big plants like Westinghouse, Sun Oil, Sun Ship, um, you know, Boeing, Vertol, you know, all these things and all these things that were supplying uh, for the war effort. And, and, and that basically where was it. But we had kids upon kids upon kids. And that's all it was. And we were all together in sports. Sports was the deal. And, um, and we just, my, my, my mother loved the Phillies, uh, being a baseball player. And she liked that Robin Roberts and Richie Ashburn, you know, guys who are in the Hall of Fame. And, and, uh, and also uh, there, was a, there was an announcer that she fell in love with. The name was Byron Sam. Like, you know, he, he'd be, he could have been him back in the day, you know. Like, and uh, so it was, it was, it was Byron, and and that was it. We, every every day, you know, we were out, but there was only one entrance in and one entr- and one exit out, and uh, you know, we were all pretty much confined with ourselves. And it was it was it was a half mile around in this circle, and it was just a bunch of kids, and all we did was play sports, kick the can, capture, whatever you know, whatever. But you know, and people wouldn't come into the neighborhood thinking that it was uh, there was a bad neighborhood. It wasn't, you know, it was it was just a bunch of bunch of people just. You know, trying to make a living, and and uh, you know, it was after the war. I was born in '46, so we're talking the '50s then. When you know, when Eisenhower was president, and um, that that was it. And but it was it was pretty cool because we were we were somehow some way we were one of the only families in that project to have a television, a black and white television, of course. You know, with the rabbit ears, 
And uh, half the time they'd have me standing there touching one of the rabbit ears because it would give the good picture. You know, I'd hold on to that sucker. But um, we and every Sunday, our Sundays revolved around the Philadelphia Eagles and NFL football. And uh, it, my, my mother would, would have the early, uh, we'd go to church, she would have the early Italian dinner, and she was English. And, and, uh, and then we would just settle in and watch the Eagles play. And there was this one guy, Tommy McDonald, who's in the Hall of Fame right now, that was my idol. And I, was this, and, I, and I just dreamed that someday that I'd meet Tommy McDonald. To me, that would have been, that would have been the ultimate dream come true. And that maybe someday, you know, I'd be a Philadelphia Eagle. So that was it, you know. And then, you know, go, go on to high school. And I grew up, I was pretty tiny. Um, and I, well, I, I, when I was 14 years old, didn't even hit five feet tall. I was about 4'11", 85, 90 pounds. Too small to play football, they said. So I played in the, I, I played in the, uh, the, the, the weight leagues they had. We didn't even, uh, they, they, they didn't have the organized leagues that they have right now. But, and, my, and we didn't have football in the neighborhood, so my dad started the team actually, and, uh, and the communities around us, they all came in, and, and we turned, uh, for the couple, three, five, four years that I played, we were undefeated and unscored upon. I mean, uh, they were kind of athletes. We had these tough kids from suburban Philadelphia, Delaware County, that we, well, we were a bunch of river rats, you know, and, uh, and, and, and that, was, that was it, you know, and that, that's how I grew up, and, you know, get to high school, and, and then finally, I, I grew a little bit and wound up uh, four, a, a four letterman. I don't think they do that anymore. I got a letter in baseball when I was a junior and then a three letter man as a senior. And uh, the big one though was football because uh, my coach uh, that was my junior high school phys ed teacher became, and back then we didn't have middle schools and stuff like we had junior high school, you know, seven, seven to nine. And you had high school, which was, uh, which was 10 to 12. And uh, you know, my, my, uh, my first phys ed teacher, uh, became the football coach when I was a senior. And I was always told I was too small because I was still around 5'5", five, 5'6", five, five, 150, 160 pounds. And he remembered me from back then. And he said, come on, I want you to come out for the team. And uh, I, wound, I wound up leading the team in, in, in touchdowns and receptions. He actually, he actually um, reconfigured the team uh, because of my catching skills. And, and we were going from basically was going to be, a, you know, a, a, a three setback, a T formation, you know, you have fullback and two halfbacks and a quarterback. And the quarterback was a converted center who had a gun for an arm. And, uh, and in, in training camp or whatever they called it, that one week of camp that we'd all go away to the mountains in Pennsylvania, um, he found out that I could catch, he could throw, and he changed the whole offense, made it a slot offense, and we wound up uh, undefeated that team and winning our sectional championship. But, uh, but I was too small to go to college and play football, but I did get a tryout. I, I was going to get a tryout, and he convinced me, this guy, my coach, and then became he, – he, he was just assigned. He, was, he didn't even apply for it. They, if we were going to have a track team at our school because the, guy, the, the track coach resigned, nobody else wanted it, so he took it. And he said, Vince, you got to help me out. He said, I know you're going to go to Westchester. You're going to try for football. He said, but you're the fastest kid, you know, you're the fastest kid in school. You'd be the fastest kid on our team. He said, you can do whatever you want. And, um, yeah, I said, all right. So I, I said, oh, how about hurdles? I, you know, I'll, I'll try the hurdles and, and, I, and I'll pole vault. He said, well, you ever pole vault before? And I said, yeah. He said, pole vault across the creek with a bamboo pole, go from one side of the one bank to the other. And I said, pole vault in, over the clotheslines in the backyard. He said, really? He said, what was the height you got? I said, oh, I'm, I don't know, six feet, something like that. And it got to the point where I was getting up to seven feet. So they would get old mattresses in the neighborhood. They would get mattresses and put them down and, and, uh, and watch me pole vault, which was pretty cool. So when you know it, uh, the pole vault uh, got me a scholarship. And out of high school, um, I, I, went, I went on and became county champ and district champ and qualified for the state finals, was in the top five there. And then on the meet of champions were all these guys that I was competing against that all got scholarships ahead of me because nobody ever knew who I was. Uh, I beat them all by a foot and a half. It was a foot and a half off the world's record. I, it was on Father's Day. And, 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 uh, and, and I hit 14-6, and John Yulsius had just cleared 16 with that new thing called the fiberglass pole. <laughs> and, uh, and, and there it was. And then I, you know, so all the schools had their guy, and uh, St. Joe's, St. Joe's College back then, a little Jesuit school in, right outside of Philly. Uh, they, they came up to me, and Lou Nicastro offered me a, a scholarship, and that was my Father's Day gift to my dad. I said, look at this, Dad. 
we're going to college, man. We're going to St. Joe's and, and there it is, you know, and then the, then the next is the progression from teaching all the way to the NFL. But uh, that's to make the short story long. But that's the way it went, man. And I'm going to stick by it, you know. And they, they didn't show it in the movie, which I understand. You know, I mean, that's a lot of stuff. And it's, it's, it's not under the budget, you know. So you got you to be worried about budgets. But it was pretty cool. So in your mind, were you always going to be football? I mean, did you think you were going to go to to college to play football rather than track? Track came to you kind of almost at last minute, it seemed like. Yeah, yeah. Track was the last minute. However, I, w- I was running track when I was in junior high, and I had a great coach. His name was Marty Stern, and he went on to become the head track coach at the University of Ten- Tennessee for a while. And then he came back to Villanova, and he coached the women at Villanova. But Marty uh, was my first real track coach when I was in seventh grade. Uh, maybe 90, 85, 90 pounds, but, but I was fast as crap. And, um, and, and, and he was this, he was a tiny guy with a really long, beautiful stride. And, uh, so he taught me how to run, how to get my fingers. You know, you get your, you don't you know, you don't run with your hands and your fists and, uh, you know, you, you put your fingers together, you touch it nice and light, you know, and how to pump the arms, keep the head still all those fundamentals, which I believe in so much now and everything, all those fundamentals were taught me by one of the best. And, I owe a lot to him because it was my speed uh, that got that, that that got recognized when I tried out in the World Football League uh, in the Philadelphia Bell, which wasn't mentioned in the movie, and also, um, of course, with the Philadelphia Eagles when Vermeil saw that, that I popped that four or five, but in grass. Well, well, before that though, so you graduate and then you get into teaching, right? You, you go back to your high school, you're teaching, yeah. you're doing some coaching. What are you thinking at, at that time? Do you, are you still thinking, I've got a chance at professional football? No, I'm thinking decathlon, actually. I was playing in these – so, so here's the deal, man. So I, 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 I'm graduating from St. Joe's. Uh, I was captain of the team, set a couple records and stuff like that. But Vietnam in 68, 69 was hot and heavy. And I'm taking my GREs, my graduate record exams, and I'm just messing with them. You know, I said, what, what am I taking this for? I'm going to get drafted. You know, I'm, I'm going to wind up overseas. I'm going to be in Vietnam. So um, because of my track, and uh, I, I, there, there were a couple of guys that knew me, uh, the, uh, the Marines and, and the Air Force were recruiting me to, uh, to, to come to them and actually be in their special services, not special forces, and special services, and, and said that, hey, man, if you come with us, uh, you'll be on our track team, you'll be on our football team, we'll let you play football. And, um, and you, you won't go to Vietnam and, you know, be this. So I was just about ready to make a decision as to what, where I was going to do. I was going to, re, I was going to enlist. And a bunch, of my guys, a bunch of my buddies were getting drafted that I had graduated from college with. Matter of fact, I just spoke to one of them. He was flying C-130s back and forth, you know, over in, in, from here to Germany to drop stuff off. And, um, and, and so I get a call from my, uh, my high school and they said, hey, you have any, you have any teaching credits? And I said, no, they said, oh, we have a, we have a, a job waiting for you that's perfect for you your business major right it's yeah well we have a we have a job for you in a high school you know and you can come back and and you can uh, you, you you'll, you'll teach and i think there's going to be a coaching job available for you and i and i said let's go you know i didn't even ask them how much money it was i said what do i need to do they said we well, need 12 credits which is four courses and i just graduated i said you know so what i did is i went to jack ramsey remember jack ramsey the jack ramsey yeah yeah. In the Hall of Fame, you know, from the uh, the old Portland, the, the Portland Trailblazer days. And uh, Jack Ramsey was our head basketball coach back then and was, and also the athletic director. I, I, I said, uh, Coach, I, I said, is there any chance I got a chance to go back to my high school? Is there any chance I can extend my graduation uh, for 12 more credits? He says, you got it, Vince. You got it. So they gave me as, as part of a scholarship. I mean, I was just another kid in the class, right? It was no big deal. And, and they gave me as part of my scholarship those 12 credits. And, uh, and I went and I got the 12 credits. I got my teaching job at my alma mater in suburban Philadelphia. In, they call it Interborough High School, right out, right by the Philly Airport, right off Interstate 95. And, um, and, and, and so there I was. I was. I was back and I was teaching and I became the head track coach. And, and I coached. And then, and then I coached the 100-pound team because my high school coach was now the high school coach there still. And he says, hey, listen, I want you to come up and coach in the high school at some point, but you need some experience, so I'm going to let you coach my 100-pound team. And I coached the 100-pound team with another guy and got some coaching experience. Eventually went and coached with them. But uh, the big deal was track. <laughs> Check this out, man. I, I was getting 
I was getting $4,800 a year. That was my salary, $4,800 a year. My rent, I had a two-bedroom apartment. And you were loving it, right? You were loving it. Well, man, I had a pretty cool pad, $100 a month. That was <laughs> that was my rent. And uh, just, just having a good old time. So, you know, I went to my alma mater and taught there for six years, but the decathlon, because I was a track guy, and in every track event that I did when I was at St. Joe's, I, I, I led off the 440 or the 4 by 100 relay. Uh, I ran the high hurdles. I, 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 I was undefeated in the triple jump, undefeated in the pole vault, and undefeated in the long jump. And, um, and we were undefeated in the 440 relay. So every, every meet that I, I, I did for St. Joe's, including the championships, I did five events. And somebody eventually just said, hey, no, you're a natural for the decathlon. So I took a shot at it, and I, I scored uh, at a, pretty, at a pretty, good, um, pretty, pretty good clip. It wasn't too far off the, um, with the, the, the qualifying for the Olympic trials. So, and in the, in the meantime, you know, the movie showed, but they don't say that in the movie either, So, which is okay. Uh, you know, they had me playing in a rough touch league, so I was doing the rough touch stuff, you know, while this was all going. And working on my master's degree in counseling. Um, and, and, you know, going through that nasty divorce where, you know, in the movie, you, you never go anywhere, you never make a name for yourself, you know, you never make any money. Okay. <laughs> Guess what? You know, da -da, get the last laugh all the time on that one. And <laughs> I think I wrote a book called Last Laugh, too. But, uh, yeah, I mean, that, 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 that was it. So I could, but then I, then I couldn't get into the decathlon. Uh, I, you know, even uh, Bruce Jenner was my idol. I mean, this guy was the man back then. Yeah. And uh, so Bruce Jenner was the idol, and he had a, he had a decathlon camp that um, if I got to a certain level, I could have gone out there and trained, and that's where I wanted to go and what I wanted to do. Uh, but it didn't quite make it, and um, so I started playing the, the guys that I was playing on the rough touch. And I understand, I'm running, I ran a 4-5 in grass. That's, that, that equates to like a 4-3-5 or 4-4 four, four at, 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 at the slowest on, on turf and what they're running now. So when I'm playing in these rough touch leagues and we're playing behind this bar called the T-Bar, these uh, half the guys that I was playing against would warm up uh, with pre-gaming at the bar, you know, and th there might be something out there that they might want to adjust as well. Uh, they, you know, I mean, the, the, they, they were out there. And, uh, you know, I, I, with my speed, I'd just blow right by them and, you know, it would be nothing to have a couple of three, uh, four touchdowns over 50 or 60 yards in, in this league. And uh, so after uh, the decathlon thing stopped and, uh, and and they all started riding me, they said, hey, if you had any guts, you'd try out for the Aston Knights in the Eastern Seaboard League, which is a semi-pro football team. So I signed a contract for a, a pair of a pair of Riddell football shoes, Riddell, yeah. right? and, and a six-pack of beer, six-pack six of bud, and that was it. No insurance, nothing. I got, I got paid nothing. And I played one year in the Aston Knights, and when you know it, I wound up leading them in touchdowns and receptions. And I think I led the league as well. We had a we had a great quarterback uh, by the name of Johnny Wower, who set all the uh, passing records at Temple University at that time. And uh, it was it was literally I didn't even know who the guys were that I was playing with from game to game, especially the offensive linemen. We we had a we had a guy that used to be a Jimmy. He was a, a, a an ex wide receiver from the Cowboys. Jimmy Scott, he was on the left, I was on the right, and and you know we just <laughs> we just winged it. Had a coach who was he weighed about five hundred pounds. Phil Phil Pompilly, man, I mean he's right out. This this was right out of Central Casting. You could have made a movie just just following this group of guys and characters. And and actually we did pretty good. We wound up in the playoffs, and in in one of the in one of the playoff games, I had a pretty uh, pretty pretty good game, a few catches, few touchdowns, few yards. And the coach of that team that we played against became the the, the general manager of the Philadelphia Bell of the World Football League, and that's the one that Zonka Kick and Warfield um, uh, defected to back in 74. And uh, I got a tryout. There were about six or 700 guys there, 80 wide receivers, and two were left standing, me and Dennis Lassi from Notre Dame. And then I had, after that, I got through that one, popped a, popped a good 40 again. And uh, I got through that one, and I had another tryout and another tryout and another after three, four tryouts. I wound up starting, and we had the infamous King Corcoran as our quarterback. And uh, he, you know, he says, he said first, he says, he says, at the, on the top of the ladder is God, and he said after that is Elvis. And he says, I'm trying to work my way up the ladder. And this was the guy <laughs> as, a, as our quarterback. But he, uh, we, we ran a, a run and shoot offense, and uh, you know, it was it was geared toward uh, 
and we had a couple of really good running backs. One, our one running back, I think, was 50 years old. And, uh, <laughs> and you know, it was just – it was so cool. Uh, but that was it. And then, But then the league folded. And my yeah. quarterback uh, for the Philadelphia Bell side from Corcoran, the second year, was Bob Davis, who was Joe Namath's backup. Back yeah. in the, now we're talking 75, 76 when Namath had that injury. And, uh, and Bob Davis came in and, you know, he, he did a pretty good job. And then uh, he decided to come over because they were offering a pretty good package to him. And then the late folded after four games. And um, so here I'm, I, 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 I'm unemployed. Uh, I, I just bought a new car. I bought a Datsun 260Z or something like that, you know, a really cool car. And, um, you know, I'm in debt. And so I started substitute teaching and, and uh, bartending at one of the bars that I played in the world. I played for four teams. I, I started bartending at one of the bars. And um, as they say, the rest is history. That's where the movie picked it up. And a, little, a lot of people don't know that I, uh, if, if, if I didn't make the Eagles, uh, my school says, hey, get this football crap. And they didn't say crap. Get this football stuff out of your, uh, out of your head and get it over with. And he says, they said, you'll have a job. We'll, we'll, we'll promise you'll have a job because there's an opening coming up in business. And I would have probably gone back, finished my master's degree, and uh, all the ones that we came in, we, we had a whole bunch of us came in right about that time. They were 22, 23 years old, just having a ball, teaching and partying and having a great time. And it was so it was such a great experience. And, uh, and, 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 uh, but I, I, I didn't need that job. That was my yeah. safety net. And then, of course, Ramil has to try out. And that's yeah. what the movie up right there. Yeah, 1974, 75, you're, you're with the Philadelphia Bell, as you mentioned there. And, uh, it, did you lie about your age? Is that true? I, I read that that uh, you were 28 at the time, but you said you were 24, trying to give yeah. yourself a little a little edge. Yeah, yeah, a little bit. Well, they 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 knew uh, the bell the, the bell knew because the guys that were from the bell, a lot of them were local. Okay. And actually, one of the owners <laughs> was the craziest thing in the world. I, I'm 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 going and I'm going to the third tryout and the third tryout, and I see this guy standing on the sideline and. He went to the same high school as me. And, and I said, Johnny, what the hell are you doing here? He said, what do you mean, what am I doing here? He says, I'm one of the owners. I said, what? He said, yeah, I'm one of the owners. So he knew how old I was. The, the, the age thing was with Coach Ramil because when in the movie, after, I had the, after we had the tryout, they have us, and he, and he has me coming out to where my car, my car wouldn't start again. You know, with this great line, it says, you know, you ran a pretty good 40. He says, that car, he says your 40s faster than this car you have right now. <laughs> you know, we went through this little thing, you know, how old you are. And, I, you know, and, and, and so at, at any rate, we had, we really had that conversation, but it wasn't outside. It was in the elevator after the workout was over. And uh, the elevator at, at Veterans Stadium. Now, understand, I'm a season ticket holder. Like, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm there for, I'm there. You know, I'm sitting up in the nosebleeds and, I, you know, just living and dying. I'm bleeding green, as green as that shirt. And, you know, as green as this, you have, who's nuts? There's a story behind this, by the way. <laughs> and uh, there's always a story behind anything. But, uh, you know, I, and, and, and uh, so, so and he says, hey, Vince, he, he said, and he knew my name. He says, you popped a pretty good 40 out there. I said, yeah. Well, yeah. I said, what I do? He said, you ran a 4.5. He, he says, I haven't seen too many guys run a 4.5. And again, this is in grass. And and uh, and, and uh, he said, how old are you? I, I said, I'm 24. <laughs> I was 30. Um, he said, um, he said where'd, you, where'd you play your college football? And I, I, I said, oh, uh, I a temple. I, I, I don't know, because he was from the West Coast. I mean, he came from UCLA. You know, what, they, what does somebody from Westwood know about uh, Philadelphia and Temple, you, and so he said, "Oh, okay, cool." So that was it. That was a conversation, and he was very friendly. And then, 15 minutes later, after I'm dressed, the athletic trainer Otho Davis says they want to see you in the executive office. As the general manager, Jimmy Murray, wants to see you. And uh, okay, and I get in the elevator up to the fourth floor. I come off the elevator, and, and that's the first time I'd ever been in the executive offices. And I freaked out because there's murals of all these guys that are like heroes of mine. And I'm still a season ticket holder. So I go through and the, the, the receptionist says, oh, yeah, they're expecting you, Mr. Papali. And uh, <laughs> so I walk, through the, I walk through the double doors and there's, there's Coach Ramil's office right there to the left. Hey, Vinny, that was a great job today. You looked really good out there. I said, whoa, thanks, Coach. And I said, I'm looking for and I see somebody with an admin, you know, a secretary sitting to the right. And I said, 
uh, where's Mr. Murray's office? And I knew who Jim was because he was a big Villanova guy and, you know, a big fan of Villanova basketball. And Villanova and St. Joe's were big rivals. And Jim knew me as, as, as a track athlete, not as a football guy. And um, at any rate, um, you know, I, I go and he offered me a kind. He said, Coach Ramil loves you. He wants to bring you to camp. I said, well, I'm, try, I'm trying not to throw up, you know. Uh, this, this is like pretty crazy stuff. He's, he says, we'd like to offer you a contract. He said, would 21000 be acceptable? I said, 21000 You kidding me? I, I was making about $200 a game for the Philadelphia Bell plus one-tenth of one percent of the uh, <laughs> the Hammeter plan. You know, one-tenth of one percent of, of the fans that are going to be there. We probably drew about 300 people. And, and uh and, and and then he says and he says oh and you'll get you'll you'll get a roster bonus two thousand dollars if you make the team Jeez. so there it was I signed a contract I didn't even look back and and I was now I still substitute teaching uh, bartending part time and um, and and he says now because of this you have you have the rights the exclusive rights not exclusive but you have the rights now to use our facilities to train and he said if you like he said I'll introduce you to Roman Gabriel Roman Gabriel. Right. I mean, from Wilmington, North Carolina, who was the quarterback for the Eagles then. And I'll introduce you to Rome and you can train with him. And uh, and, and he did. And and, Ro- and and then I trained with my buddy, Danny Franks, uh, who was uh, I was a doorman with, with, you know, as also part time. I used to be a doorman at one of the nightclubs in Philly. And, and then he had just been picked up by the Eagles uh, from Oakland. And he was getting basically a free agent tryout like me. And uh, so we teamed up. And, uh, and and just started training together along with Roman Gabriel and this and this character called uh, Gus Hoffling, because he also trained not only Roman. Roman was one of the first guys I ever saw. Now you know how tall he was. He was six four, six five, whatever. He could do a lateral split, a lateral split, not just a, a split split. He could do a lateral split and go down and touch his nose on the ground. I've never ever seen, except for a gymnast, ever seen anybody do that. That's how flexible he was. So, but he was training with, guess who's Steve Carlton from the Phillies, Mike Schmidt from the Phillies. And we shared the same showers and stuff. So I got to meet all these guys. I'm, I'm out of my mind because these, these guys. You're, you're a season ticket holder, right? I mean, that's. But yeah, but I'm also, I love the Phillies. Yeah. You know, my mom loved the Phillies. I can't, if my mom, you know, she, she was, she was at that point, she was alive. And, but she, she was, she went through a rough, my mom actually went through uh um, mental illness, and, and uh, she was in and out of mental hospitals when I was going through high school. My coach, George Corner, uh, really had a tremendous impact on my life in that. He was my mentor throughout all this stuff. And, and, it, and, and I told her, I said, Mom, you're not, ble- not going to believe this. I said, I, I actually can go into the Phillies dugout, and, and there's Larry Boa, and there's Pete Rose, there's Mike Schmidt, you know, Greg Luzinski, and Steve Carlton. And, and then I wind up training with, uh, with a couple of those guys. But uh, but Roman was the guy, and, and every day he threw to me, and, and, he, and he would show me, you know, little nuances of routes. And um, when we got to training camp, and this was all starting around April and May of 1976, training camp started January 3rd, I mean, fe- uh, July 3rd, July 3rd, 1976, and it's the bicentennial, and there's all this stuff that's going on at, right outside of training camp, which is just a couple miles outside of Philly. And Coach Vermeil was so much what he was doing, he didn't even realize it was the Fourth of July, I think, or the bicentennial. He's wondering why all these why all these World War II planes and you know are coming over our head right you know on the way to the Philly airport because it's just around the corner from where we are. And it, it was the craziest thing in the world. But that first week of training camp, it was rookies and free agents, like a lot of them, you know, they they used to bring in. And guess who my quarterback was? Gabe. And he was throwing at me all the time, always throwing at me. Wow. And, and, you know, I, we, we just had this thing. And, you know, I, I, if, 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 in, 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 uh, when, once the veterans came in, like, you know, I know you, you interviewed John Bunning and, and some of the other guys came in, Bergie and, you know, uh, who, the, the, the team. I, I, I backed off a little bit because to me it was, it, I was, I was uh, emotionally intimidated. You know, yeah. like, these are my idols, you know, and, and I, in that previous week, I hit everything that moved. If it had a green jersey on, I nailed it. You know, and I don't care if they were going to do a sweep on the left-hand side and I was a Z receiver on the right. I still hit that cornerback and let him pay. And that pissed him off. That's why you saw in the movie 
you know, they call me all pro practice and this and that. You got to lighten up a little bit, dude. And I says, hey, I'm just trying to make the team make an impression. You know, if you don't want to get hit, I tell them that. So you don't want to get hit, just get away. Get, and I'll tell you what I'll do. Here's what I'll do. I said, if I'm coming in to hit you, I'll start yelling. And that'll give you that'll give you a warning. It'll be like a siren. Then I'm going to blast you. I mean, they, they thought I was they thought I was out of my mind. We get in a nutcracker drill, and they, they put a, a, a defensive back up against me. And I say, nah. He said, these guys, they, they don't hit. You know, he says, give me, give me a linebacker. I want somebody that's going to hit me. And oh, that would tick them off even more. And um, so what you saw in the movie with the reaction I got from the D-backs and a lot of guys, they thought I was cocky, you know, and I wasn't. I was just, you know, I was just trying to show the coach that I was tough. And, um, and, but, and, and then that one scene in the movie, you know, where I caught the ball and I ran downfield about 60 yards, I did that all the time. Every pass I caught. I did that, and the fans, because we were at Widener College, Widener University now, I was only a couple miles from where I grew up. My dad from Westinghouse, all his buddies, all the guys I, I used to play in the rough touch leagues, my students, the kids I coached and taught. You know, in the beginning, there would be 100 people in the stands. Now there's 1,000 people in the stands, and 1,900 of them have a relationship to me somehow. And, uh, and every time I caught a pass and did that, the stands would go crazy. And then I would just jog back real slowly. And Coach Ramil would look around, and you know they knew who they were cheering for. So it was, you know, it was that visual impression. And well, uh, you're you're one of them, right? I mean, they they, they could see you as being that you were the guy that were in the seats with them at one point, and now you're living out every fan's dream, right? Well, that's what, yeah, you know, that's what I say is I, I put the I put the helmet on, I put the shoulder pads on for the fans. Simple as that, you know, n- nothing. Nothing not true about that. And and they appreciated that. And when I'd come flying out of the tunnel and then the remainder of the Philadelphia Eagles, you know, and then poof, I'd just fly out there and go into the um go into the end zone. I wasn't like bicycle hammer, you know, I wasn't pounding and doing, you know, doing a Rocky thing. But I was they were calling me the real life Rocky back then. And uh, you know, I point up, you know, there's my mom and you know, there's my dad. My mom couldn't go to the game. She she uh, she had that you know she'd social disorder so she couldn't uh, she she couldn't be amongst crowds but uh, my dad was always in the stands and you know my all my buddies you know the guys from the movie they were all there it was pretty cool yeah so oldest rookie at 30 years old the well, oldest to, to not play college football as well as you said you know you looked at these guys and you were a little starstruck did it take you a while to feel like hey i belong with these guys yeah, yeah, I wasn't quite sure, you know, and, and Coach Ramil came up to me and actually says, uh, he says, what's going on? You're, he, he says, you're sloughing off. And I, and I said, Coach, I said, you know, these guys, these are my idols. I don't want to get them hurt. I don't care about these other guys, you know. And, and, he's, and, and he said, what do you mean? He said, do you, you know what, their, you know what their, uh, the, the record was last year? I, you know, I think it was 4-10. and 10. We played 14 games then and six, and six preseason games. Training camp was eight weeks. And... Um, he said, and, and he says, listen, man, he says, you have a, you have a shot at making this team. He says, I'm going to give you a couple preseason games and uh, get through whatever you've gone through. He said, but I'm going to give you a couple preseason games and show me what I think you have. He said, you have the potential to play in the NFL. And he says, I need a guy like you. To, to, I need that fifth wide receiver that's going to be the special teamer. And he says, you could be the guy if you want to be. It's all up to you from now on. So, uh, you know, I picked up my pace. I got the support of him. I had a couple of coaches that, like in the movie, uh, did not support me at any at, at any any rate, and they were riding me pretty hard. And we would have two sets going one field to the other, and, and the one coach, um, not to be mentioned, he would have me running with with the uh, with the ones up on the top, and then I have to run down a hill um, down where there was another field where there was an elementary school for crying out loud. And I'd run with the twos, threes, fours, and then they'd have me coming back up. I was doing double sets, you know, we were doing team stuff, but I, you know, I just kept my mouth shut. I was in great shape because of my track and my training program, which started with a, a three or four, four mile run, you know, in the off season, uh, through the streets of Philly, a la Rocky. And that's how I, uh, you know, that's, that's how I got myself in, in shape, ready to go for that training camp. And then, the first preseason game, I didn't get into the game against the, it was against the Chargers and it was out there. I didn't get into the game until after the two minute warning. I get Papali out there. Let's see what he can do. And I had two grabs, two first downs on site adjustments, which meant I, I, I read the defense and the quarterback read the defense and it was called a site adjustment. We made, you know, instead of running, let's say a, a hitch, I ran a, I ran a slant because I saw 
I saw the safety blitz. When the when the safety comes up, you just he vacates the area. You know, you drop what you're doing and you go right and you, you run the slant first down. And then the next one that you know I was supposed to run, um, I was supposed to run a hitch on the sideline. They come in to cover two, which means the cornerback has got the short zone and the safety has to come out and he's got to go the deep third about 20 yards downfield on the sideline. So I ran what's called a fade. Boom, first down, two first downs. And um, that was pretty much the whole offense. And the next day, uh, the coach went nuts. He said, look at this guy. I mean, he, he never even played it down at NFL football, or down at college football, yet he can read a defense. And then the next game was against the New England Patriots, you know, and Tim Fox and I, that was their, their guy from Ohio State. He and I started battling each other on special teams because the coach then for that next game put me in special teams. And I wound up uh, with a couple of three grabs and, and a touchdown. Whoa, how'd that happen? You know, this guy didn't play college football. Now it's the fourth preseason game against the Miami Dolphins. And coach comes up to me and said, Carmichael's out today. He says, you're starting tonight, Vinny. Are you ready? That's at, at the Orange Bowl? Are you kidding me? I mean, you know, I'm, right now I, we have, I have palm trees all over the place down here in Jupiter. You know, they're, all, they're almost like they're pine trees. But, you know, then when you're growing up in Philadelphia to yeah. see palm trees – and they'd be staying at the Doral, you know, and, you know, I'm trying to, I'm trying to study by the pool, you know, um, my game plan and there's a lingerie show going on. I mean, are, is this, is this, is this the NFL or what? And, uh, and so anyway, that, that, that night, um, I wound up with five catches, um, a couple knockdown blocks, a, a couple scuffles, guys trying to, you know, mess with me a little bit, you know, the Rocky thing started coming out. And, uh, the next day, um, we flew back right after the game was over, and the next day, uh, coach says, "Look at this," and he and he actually had a highlight film of what I did the night before, and that was it. I knew I had it, and uh, so the next, then the fifth game, I had a pretty good game, and then the sixth was against the Vikings, and um, and, and I'll never forget it. I, I twisted my ankle, and I and I had to go off the field, and I was in the elevator, and Paul Krause, who was their safety, uh, he's 83. He says, uh, he says, "I know a little bit about your story." He says, "Good luck to you." He said, "You got a shot," and that was. And I'm like, "Paul Krause, are you kidding?" Oh, wow. You know, from the from the from the Minnesota Vikings, and yeah. um, so I, it, you know, and then you know the the last cut, and what's a little bit different the way the the movie showed it because there was something that was called the Rudy moment that uh, we couldn't we we couldn't infringe upon their copyrights and some of the things they did, but it was pretty cool. Yeah, t- take us through that. When when did you? find out that you did make the team and you were going to be on again the team that you were a season ticket holder for 10 years well in the movie they had that scene where the uh, where the turk comes up the turk is the guy that cuts everybody when the turk comes up and he says coach wants to see you and if you're cut they say bring your playbook so but he comes up and you know they're all they're all laughing and having a good old time and when i had walked into the locker room in real life when i walk into the locker room i saw i had a locker and I had, the, I had the last locker right next to the door that went into the bathrooms, you know, but which was perfect because the bathrooms, they had another door that went out to the Phillies, you know, so I got to know some of those guys. But anyway, um, and, and there's a locker that's got my name on it in plastic, spelled correctly, and there's a Jersey 83, there's a helmet, it's nice and shiny, I mean, all the gear. Um, and so anyway, going back now to the movie, and in the movie, you know, the Turk, it was Bill Davis at that time, he was a tight ends coach, and he coached at Michigan. Uh, prior to that, uh, Bill Davis and I had formed a relationship with his family because we belonged to the same pool when I was uh, where, where I was living. And uh, Bill and I, uh, Bill came up and he and he just sort of uh, in, in, in the movie, he comes up to me and, and he says, coach wants to see you. And then all the guys in the movie start. Hey, yeah, there we go. You know, they're high five and think the one guy made a team that was probably in jeopardy. And that's why I just took my playbook anyway, but he didn't ask me to do it. And when I got there, it's when they had the office scene. And, uh, you know, how you feeling, coach, that kind of stuff, a little playful stuff between coach and I. And then I go to hand him my playbook and he pushes it back. He says, you might need this for a while. Wow. And, uh, you know, he said so that and then they created that scene. I come out and there's my buddy out there. The car's not, you know, the car's supposedly not working. And and it was great. It was a little bit different than that. But in real life, here's how it happens. So I go in there and nobody's telling me I had made a team. And the Turk comes up and he goes to this one guy. I'll just say his name is Don. And he was from, he was a wide receiver, a slick wide receiver. He was part of the fire high gang that, uh, that, that, uh, Roman had, you know, he had six, he had, he had, he had Chow, Chow Young was six, six. He had Howard Carmichael six, seven. And he had this other guy from Mississippi who was six, four, and they called him the fire high gang. 
And uh, well, anyway, the Mississippi guy, Turk, comes up and he looks at me. And, and it's Bill, it's my buddy. And he looks at me and I, and I lifted my playbook, you know, just out of, out of, out of I, I guess, um, reflex. And he just laughed at me and he points at the other guy, right? And he, and he takes him in and I never saw him again. Wow. So I'm, I'm like, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm going crazy. I'm, I'm out of my mind. Yeah. So we went on a practice field and the stadium is set up for baseball. So we're in right field. You know, we're along the first baseline right field where the Phillies dugout is. And there's a payphone there. I know there's a payphone. So at any rate, we're, we're doing the stretching and I'm looking up in the stands and I'm thinking, holy crap, we're playing the Cowboys next week. And, you know, my boys can see me now, you know, and my dad and all the guys, you know, they, we had in a movie. So then Coach Ramil comes over and, and he looks at me, he's got this sheepish grin and I figured, oh crap, man, he's going to cut me right now. And uh, he just comes up, he has a sheepish grin. He said, congratulations, old man. Welcome to the team. You're a Philadelphia Eagle. And I jumped up and I gave him a big hug. You know, I said, oh, I can't believe this. And I said, hey, Coach, I said, can you do me a favor? I said, can I make a phone call? Because I had in my pocket the phone number for the shop steward at Westinghouse, Slim Kaufman. And they, they said, whatever happens, you've got to call us. You know, back we didn't have cell phones. They, just, they have pay phones, if anybody knows what they are rotaries you know? yeah and, and so he said what are you gonna have a press conference already i said no i said i gotta call my dad please so he he got to know my dad because my dad was at every practice every wow. practice and his dad his dad was a mechanic my dad was a mechanic there was a there was a really a connection between our, our backgrounds and you know where we came from and our, and you know our genetics and those kinds of things and we were both teachers and coaches that it, it, it wasn't a it wasn't a mistake that that I would that I was there, you know, because you know we we're both teachers, coaches, our we had Italian connection, the whole deal, mechanic connection. So anyway, I said I got to call my dad. So I go, he so go ahead, yes, I'll give you five minutes. And and I went and and I called my dad. I, I got hey, hey, and I get collect call for for uh, for Slim Kaufman, and then he said Slim Kaufman here. He said uh, he said collect call from Vince Papale, Vince or whatever, pay a papale. He said, Vince. So my nickname was Vincey. Vincey, Vincey, I said, hey, I said, Slim, yo, Slim. I, tell, I said, tell Kingy, my dad's nickname was Kingy. His little boy's a Philadelphia Eagle. And he said, Kingy, Kingy, we did it. Vincey's an Eagle. You could hear it in the background. They were going nuts. <laughs> Westinghouse, they were going crazy. Everybody was like on their toes waiting because my dad was so proud of me. And, uh, and that's how they found out. But we couldn't use that scene because if you remember Rudy, who's my buddy, my good pal. I love yeah. him. Yeah, we, we talk all the time. He's a great kid, a uh, great kid, great young man, great great guy. So Rudy, uh, they they called they they called that a Rudy moment, and because uh, he had called his dad when he found out he made Notre Dame, so we couldn't use it. So they created that that office scene with Coach Ramil. But that's how I found out. And then that night, man, I'll tell you what, we just tore it apart. <laughs> we tore Max's in the nightclub that I I I worked out with Denny Franks, and then Denny Franks found out he made the team that day. And then we've been on to become roommate, roommates and teammates. We, we, he's the godfather of my children. And, and God bless Danny. I love him so much. He, we, we lost him right around Thanksgiving last year. But uh, God damn, I couldn't have done it without him. It was, it, it was crazy. We had so much fun. 1976 to 1978. So you didn't just make the team. You were on the team for several years. Uh, played in 41 games. Mm -hmm. What do you remember most maybe about that? It, it, does that first game stick out? Yeah, most or is it that a Cowboys game? Is it a Giants game? Again, being a fan, you know, going up against those teams probably meant a little bit more to you than maybe some of the other players. Well, you know what it was. I, the, the one thing is, it, it's just just a little bit of a correction. I actually got credit for four years playing because yeah. my the fourth year in the first preseason game against the Baltimore Colts, the original Baltimore Colts. I think Johnny U was the quarterback. And um, United, so nobody knows who that was. And uh, and in that game, I was having a really good game because the Eagles had drafted uh, Scott Fitzke from Penn State, and uh, and I was going head to head with him. And I had four catches. But what happened is at the end of the the, the third season, I, I had I you, you can see this bone popping up here. Mm -hmm. I had a, a third degree AC separation, so they they uh, they put it back together, you know, and they they sewed it and they they they, they actually drilled it into my scapula. And in the first uh, in, in the first game preseason game, I reseparated I reseparated it 
uh, because of a cheap shot that the number one uh, draft pick gave me on the sideline. I was out of bounds and I had caught the pass and he hit me with his helmet right in the scapula and it just drove the bone right back up and that was it. It was a little bit, you know, it still needed some work. And so I was so pissed off that, um, and, and I didn't tell anybody, and Coach says, you're out of the game. I said, Coach, one more play, please, one more play, because this guy was returning punts, and I wanted to get him so bad, revenge, right? Well, guess what? He got the last laugh because I got him, but I, I was coming in on the right shoulder, and, and I didn't want to do it because, uh, you know, the separation and the pain. So I went in with the left, and I dislocated my left shoulder and tore it right out. So uh, that was it. So I spent the I spent the fourth year on injured reserve, and I got credit, and I got a pension out of it. So it's pretty cool. So you know, and but and then they went on to be in the NFC Championship game, which was which was pretty cool as well. But you know, I, I wasn't a part of that. But um, so uh, yeah, I didn't. Uh, what, where were where, where, where we were going at that point? Well, to, I, to the head. Again, for what, what was in your mind? Obviously, your yeah. last game right there, right. you know, the memory. But do you you know, is that first game? You know, is oh, that one that you always remember? You know what, Dallas, uh, may, maybe so. It was such a blur for Dallas. Uh, and when I walked out on the field for the first time, it was so hot. It was like 110, 120 degrees on that turf. And the sun, it was coming through. They had that little skylight up there. Yeah. Um, and and I, it really, I, I had I, I had a vertigo. I literally had vertigo. I couldn't breathe. I was so nervous. I, you know, and, and I was I was watching I was watching a thing last night about Luke Bryan, one of my, my favorite, you know, I, I love Luke Bryan, and he was talking about how the first time he went up in a big event and how nervous he was. And I was, I was saying to Janet, I said, oh. I said, thank God, you know, I, I wasn't the only guy who was so nervous he couldn't breathe. And uh, so that game was a blur. The one that really, that really was the one was that first game when we're at Veterans Stadium and, and just coming out and, and seeing the stadium empty before the game and then seeing all the stuff that's going on, the practicing of the anthem. You know, the bands are out there, the cheerleaders are out there, and it's just me and Denny Franks. We're just looking, and we're sitting on a bench. Our ankles are taped. We're in a pair of shorts, and it's it's hot. It's about 85, 90 degrees, and we're just looking around thinking that in, in about two hours, there's going to be 70,000 people there. And when they announced us and the remainder of the Philadelphia Eagles, and there it was, me and Denny, just coming through that tunnel and the cheerleaders, our feet didn't even touch the ground. And, and I'll just, I'll never forget that first hit and I'll forget the last hit. And, and I got invited, that's when I was accepted by the team and I got invited to my first team party. And I was sitting there having a beer with Roman Gabriel, John Bunning, you, you know, Gorbert Montgomery. I mean, what could, what could have been better than that? And, um, and that was it. So I, I do remember that. Now when I got cut from the team um, in, in the third year and then brought back after four games and Coach Ramil uh, introduced the special teams, and I was the last guy to come out. And to hear the reception and the eruption of the stands and all the signs that were up there, they show in the movie, uh, you know, Invincible Vince or whatever they were, you know, real rocky kind of stuff. And that, that was pretty cool. So, yeah. And, and a, just said, you know, the injury kind of forced your retirement, but at the same time, you know, and, and sometimes it's difficult for pro players to make that adjustment and that transition from being a pro player to retirement. Was it an easier adjustment for you? Because, I mean, you're almost in a place where maybe you never thought you were going to be, but now you've got to retire. What was that transition like for you? Well, it, it, at first it was tough, you know, because you wanted so much to be a part of it and you see the team being very successful and you're not part of it. You know, after they get to the to the um, to, to the situation where I'm pretty well healed, I could have come back, and they and they made the decision not to bring me back. You know, then you do okay. This is so. Um, I, I was doing at that time. I was doing TV for CBS Channel 10 in Philadelphia, and doing the weekend sports. So I did a little bit of that, and they brought uh, one of their old timers back from Chicago, and I just didn't fit into their programming. So I was let go from them, and I couldn't get a job somewhere else because of restrictive clause of my contract. So I got into, um, I, I got into radio and, and I was doing radio for five or six years and which was really cool because the radio station that we had back then was the flagship station for the 76ers and the joy of serving the Dr. J t guys. And, and, uh, <clears throat> and so with the 76ers and they wound up winning the world's championship. So I had, a, I was able to be a part of that and be an intimate part of that. And then uh, after a while, I just, you know, I started getting up at four o'clock in the morning. I was mo most half the time I was coming in around three o'clock in the morning. And um, so I was tired of that. And I got into sales and marketing. And, that, and that's what it, that, that's basically 
what I did. And, and then in 1992, you know, I was very successful mortgage sales and, and working for some major corporations that had recruited me to come with them. And, uh, and then uh, the, 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 I met the love of my life, and, and that's, uh, that's Janet Cantwell Papawe. And uh, maybe, I'll, maybe I'll grab her if we, if we have a second. I'll, I'll open the, the door here and tell her to get out here. But, yeah, she, uh, she's an outstanding athlete in her own right, right? I'll say, well, I see, she's the jock in the family, aside from our son. My daughter is a great athlete. Uh, but, uh, yeah, Janet was the one. You know, they have her portrayed as a Giants fan in the movie and all that, you know, and a, and a, uh, and a bartender. But in reality, Janet and, and Kathy Rigby were, were teammates on the USA World Gymnastics team. And she wore USA in her jersey. I don't know. There it is. That, that's it. That's, that's the jersey that Janet wore. Isn't that cool? Yeah. How cool is that, you know? So, so Janet wore that jersey, and she was teammates and roommates and, and best friends with Kathy Rigby, who was on that Olympic team in Munich. And, um, and, and, uh, but Janet didn't get to Munich because of, she, she had a sprained ankle that she, that in the trials. She was ready. She was, she was making the team, and then she sprained her ankle. So then uh, eventually um, she, she was doing it on the world team and the world games, and, and she blew her knee out. And now she's a teenager. All this is happening when she's a teenager. She goes to Penn State and, and, th and starts diving for Penn State and set all their diving records. So, yeah, it's great. You know, it's, it's a good golfer. You know, I mean, you golf down here, you, you know, you better, you better be able to play golf. So she's a good golfer and, you know, really, really something special. And with that, we, she's gifted me with two of the most beautiful gifts I've ever gotten in my life. And my daughter, Gabrielle, and my son, Vinny. Yeah, it's pretty. Vinny's in USFL right now. It's going to be a national TV on Fox at 4 o'clock with the Tampa Bay Bandits against the New Orleans Breakers. So, yeah. yeah. So I'm, yeah. I'll, I'll be, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm in the plane tomorrow heading out to Birmingham. You know, I'll be out there with my little boy. So it's going to be pretty cool. Yeah, Vinny, who played at, at Delaware now, as you yeah. said, in, in the USFL. So, so uh, again, these other ventures – uh, the sales, the marketing, uh, broadcasting, and eventually the movie comes out. You reference it quite a bit, Invincible, uh, released August 25th in 2006. How did that come about? What, was it you going to them? Did they come to you? How did that all eventually get to, to the screen with Mark Wal Wahlberg playing you? Well, I didn't really have much to say about Mark Wahlberg and anything else like that. Actually, it, it all started in 2002, and I have my friend uh, Sylvester Stallone and, and his character Rocky to thank. Because as I'm going through this, if, 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 if you know the, just the seed of Rocky, Rocky was a 30-year-old 30 30 Hammenegger. You know, he, he fought at the Blue Horizon, all these great venues in Philadelphia. And, you know, he was a wise guy back in the day. And, uh, but, a, but a great character and an introspective character, you know, that, that eventually came out. At any rate, I, I was that I, I was called the real life Rocky because I was the 30-year-old guy that, you know, that, that gave it a shot. So um, as a result, and then the movie Rocky in 2002 is turning 25, and we get a phone call from NFL Films. And I was living at that time in Cherry Hill, New Jersey, in NFL Films. I know everybody there because it's only five or six miles away. And, and Jaws, you know, all my buddies are there. And I, I, I would, I would be, I'd be there half the time just doing stuff. And um, so NFL Films says, hey, we're going to do a feature of Monday Night Football. We'd like to feature you. Uh, and your comparison to Rocky to celebrate the 25th anniversary of Rocky. Okay, so the Eagles are playing the 49ers, and it's Monday Night Football, and Stuart Scott's the, the, the is the commentator coming in, the pregame commentator, along with Ron Jaworski, right? And they have this feature, and they're messing around, and you know Stuart's messing with Jaws about me, and you know Jaws and I. Are, I'm going to matter of fact next week. I'm going to be with Ron Jaworski and, and and most of my teammates, a lot of my teammates, uh, honoring Dick Vermeil. Yeah. Uh, because yeah, next Thursday night we're going to honor Dick Vermeil and his induction into the Hall of Fame, and then he has a big golf tournament because Ron's so involved in, the, in charities in the greater Philadelphia area. So um, at, at, at any rate, um, where were we again? Uh, talking about the, the movie and how the movie oh, yeah, came yeah, about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So at, at any rate, so so the movie here's so Jaws is talking with Stuart Scott, and then they show the feature, and I have I I, I had a, I had. 25, 30, 50 people at my house, including ABC, NBC, Fox. They were all there, you know, with film crews filming. Cause I, they wouldn't let me see this feature. This was a surprise to me. And then they showed it, and the next day Hollywood's calling. Wow. And, yeah, and and there were four or five producers and, and executive producers saying that we want to take a shot 
and you know and, and do the story but this one guy ken mock he's the one that had the best plan and ken nobody would know him except you would know one of his his most famous shows america's next top model and he was one of the first guys to do reality tv for mtv so he says i'm going to get a writer i got brad gann he did the oscar de la hoya story he's done some movies he's got a couple in the can and i'm going to pay for the whole thing and and he says and then we're going to write a script and and this is what we're going to do so what he did he did that and he wrote and he gave the script to uh, to a whole bunch of uh, producers out there, and and all these producers on uh, on uh, October fourteenth, I'll never forget this, uh, two thousand four, on October fourteenth, all these producers went to Paramount, Columbia, New Line, Sony, and the guys that took the movie to uh, Disney is Mark Chiardi and Gordon Gray, and they're the two guys that did Miracle and Rookie, that were out before me, and I love the Rookie. Uh, Miracle's my Aside from Rocky, is as Rushmore, but a Miracle was without a doubt my favorite sports movie, and um, and so they they take it into Disney, and Disney took a look at it, and so we love it. So the, the Wayne Abyssal Pictures, who was the arm, the the, the the shooting arm for the video arm for Disney, they the the president, she says, I I did, I mean, let me look at the script, I look at the script. She wrote notes, and as they say, the rest is history. There. And uh, in 2004, Mark Wahlberg becomes my <laughs> becomes my twin brother, and uh, we shot the movie in Philadelphia and Dallas uh, for 13 weeks in the uh, in the late summer and early fall of, uh, of 2005, and then the, then they edited it in Santa Monica, and the movie came out as you said on the 25th of September in 06. We were number one in the box office uh, for the first two weeks, uh, generating 30 million dollars back then. That's pretty good money. And did good. So we ran number one, and uh, you know they kept it out there for a few weeks, and you know then then you know went to went to the DVD, and Mark and I are so close, still so close, and just so proud of him and what he's done, and you know the stand he takes for people, and especially the military. It's just so excited to say that I'm a friend of Mark Wahlberg's. But he he worked his ass off, man. I'll tell you, he did. And Elizabeth Banks it, with, it was was so cool playing Janet. And, uh, and Greg Kinnear actually was so intense about his role that he went down to Kansas City and spent two days with Dick Vermeer when he was the head coach at KC. And then Michael Norrie from Flashdance, the guy that drove the Porsche, uh, he was our owner, Leonard Toast. And it was just a perfect combo. And all the guys, the, the touch football guys, uh, they were all from the Arena Football League. So all the hitting that you saw in the movie was intense and real. Nothing was fake. Uh, and the rough touch scenes, except for the actors, you know, the, the mud scenes and all that, they were first responders. They brought they brought in uh, they brought in uh, the fire firefighters and law enforcement to be those guys there. And um, it, it was it was just so cool how they did it. Just to walk on set, you know, and to see how it was done was out of out of, out of this out of this world. Well, it's amazing. And we just had Jim Morris from the Rookie on last week's episode, episode number thirty-one. And you said a connection between you two and and with the movies uh, very similar. He was the oldest rookie in the. Major League Baseball, you're the oldest rookie in, in the NFL. And, and speaking of the movie, and, and you mentioned some of the differences, is there anything that's that's not in the movie that you really wish it was in there? Maybe tells a little bit more about you and your journey? Well, one of the things I really liked about Jim Morris's story is how they went back, you know, and, and they had gone back and, and you know, and then talk about the relationship he had with his dad. His dad was military, pretty tough. My dad wasn't military, but you would have thought. Uh, he, he was very, he was pretty tough. Uh, but discipline, because he had to be tough, you know, and my mom was going through everything and we we're having issues with, with money, food, insurance. I mean, you know, I can't imagine what it was like for my father uh, being back there. I wish, though, that we had gone back a little bit and, and touched on, 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 on some of the things. Now it's so important, uh, but, you know, maybe 15 years, you know, the mental, the mental illness aspect of things, you know, how my mom was suffering from that and the bullying that I had to go through. Uh, because of everybody knowing that my mom was in a mental hospital a lot. And, uh, you know, everybody, you know, talked about my mom being a, a nut, being a drug addict, being a drinker, a drunk, and all that stuff, you know. And so th that I wish could have been highlighted a little bit so you can see how, because if you get that right person in your mind, that mentor, to be there, and that would be the guy, Coach George Corner, my high school coach, my high school football coach, the guy that brought me in to do track, and the guy I went to, when I was trying out for the Eagles and said, do I really want to do this? And he said, Vince, he said, you, you, you earned a shot to do this. Forget about how old you are. 
And, and he said, you got to chase your dream. And that's what I liked. I saw this, this thing last night with, 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 with uh, Luke Bryan and all he kept talking about, you know, the price to be paid to chase that dream and all the heartache that he had to go through with the death of, of his, of his brother and his sister and his brother-in-law and how he's such a super superstar. And he had all these people behind him. Well, I had this person and that was my coach. And, um, and, and my coach, you know, he gave me this quote. He said, happy are those who dream dreams and are willing to pay the price to make them come true. And I use that in my speeches where I go all over the country and world. And I, I can build a whole speech just on that. Are you willing to pay the price? And I was, and I was, and I, and I had so many people behind me giving me the support. Not that I didn't have a lot. Uh, you can't do it. It's never been done before. You don't have the right resume. You didn't play college football. It's too risky. It's too this. But you know, it all comes down to re it's resentment because people just don't, they don't want to take risks and, you know, because they're maybe they're insecure. But I think the way I tell my kids, I, I said, it was all about jealousy. It was that, you know, because they were afraid what's going to happen to this guy if it happens. So I've always made, I, I've always made this, uh, the, the, just treat everybody nice, you know, and try to be as humble as you can be. And uh, you, we're, in a, we're in a beautiful spot right now, especially because there's a lot of heartache that's going on around the, around the country, around the world, and make a positive influence on those that are, are questioning themselves or questioning other people as to whether it can be done or can't be done. You know, where are we going to go with this? What are we going to do with it? And, and I like to think that, you know, I'm not a, I'm not a big social media guy. Um, and they, 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 people are making millions of dollars being influencers. Uh, I like to think I'm an influencer just by being who I am and being a good role model for those out there, whether it's a, a child, an adult, whatever it may be. Uh, but, you know, just, just try to stay the course and be the best dad and husband I can be right now. And I'm watching my kids chase I'm I'm watching Vinny, you know, chase his dreams. And just the text I got from him today about, you know, about where, where he is in his dream. And my daughter, Gabriella, you know, and talking about relationships and it's just so cool, you know, and then Janet and I, we're jocks, you know, we're coaches, you know, <laughs> and we, we talk jock talk, you know, we have a different language and we hold nothing back, you know, whatever, whatever she did, whatever I did, forget about it. You know, what it is, is that slate was clean. And that's one of the things Dick Vermeil said when he came in is I don't care anything. I don't care what your history is, whether you're an all pro or you're an all nothing. He said, everybody here in this locker room has a clean slate and this is where we're going to start it. And he held to his word and now he's going to be in the hall of fame. I'm going to cry so much next Thursday when I see him. And he was, he was, he was a big influencer in my, in my, in my son, you know, he made calls around and uh, I mean, they got drafted by, by Todd Haley, Who's, who's who coached with Coach Ramil, you know, in Kansas City, and and now he's out there with Tampa Bay, and and Todd thinks that he could be a pretty good slot in the NFL. So we'll see, we'll see how it goes. You got to get, get there, and you got to make it. Will you be at the induction ceremony, the Pro Football Hall of Fame? Yes, with, sir. With I, I, I have that distinct honor of being invited by Coach Ramil. I will be there. Uh, it's it's going to be an interesting week because uh, my friend, our friend Doug uh, Doug Peterson. Uh, who we've known since 1999, kids have grown up together. Uh, he's going to be there because they're going to be playing the Raiders in the Hall of Fame game. So, <laughs> so we're doing that. And and, and ironically, my wife sound that sold him his house up in Jacksonville. You know, so <laughs> it, it's it's going to be a great weekend. It's going. I mean, it's, I mean, it's going to be Philly. It's going to Philly's going to take over that. You know what they're going to whether they can get there or not. It, it's, they, they say there'll be 200,000 people. I guarantee it. There'll be a half a million people, and 200, 250,000 will be from Philly, just going down there to drive down. So we're going over there, up there, where I am right now. Yeah, I mean Philly sports fans, the passion. I would think, and you could probably speak to this, goes beyond maybe any other fan bases across the country. But when you were revered from them, how much did you kind of feed off of that love and that passion from the Philly fans? Immensely, I still do. I still do. You know, we, we, we do have a home in Philadelphia now. Um, I call it my pit stop. It's a great area. There's cobblestone streets around there. It goes back to the 1800s. It's really cool. And to not be there for three or four weeks or months and then to walk in somewhere, yo, Vinny, how you doing? What's going on? You know, I mean, it's, 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 it, it still gives me, it, it still gives me a great feeling. And, um, and, and I don't think it's because I, my ego needs that. It's just that I, I, I made an impact, I think, and we made an impact. And, and it's, it, and right now people need that, you know, dreams are being shattered and, 
for whatever reason, whether it's kids, adults, and, you know, mental illness is the highest level and, you know, with, with what's going on with drug addiction, alcoholism, people need somebody to believe in them and somebody to look up to. And hopefully I can be that guy. And just, just simply because of this one word, invincible. And, uh, you know, I don't have to tweet. I don't have to Instagram. I don't have to Facebook. I do that. What I do in there, I just do that to, to talk about my family and how proud I am of them. Well, again, as you said, you're not really on, in, on social media, but how can people follow you? Do you have a website? Do you have uh, other ways that people can maybe even book you as a motivational speaker? Obviously, you know, I can tell you you're very passionate about that as well and have a, a good message. How can people get in touch with you for that? Well, uh, yeah, thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah, it's really simple. Just go to www.vincepapelli, all one word, dot, Vince dot com. Oh, there it is. Yeah, and right, right around the top, you see in the top and one of those, those things up there, um, so you just go, you know, how to contact Vince and, and that's how you can get a hold of me. And, you know, uh, from our end and my family's end, uh, we've come up with the Papali group and, uh, my wife and has been in the, been in the game for 39 uh, years and my daughter and Vinny are back in the game now and, and they're, they're licensed in Pennsylvania, New Jersey and Florida. So we formed the Papali group and we're bringing people around and doing real estate around there. So real excited about that. And I'm you know excited about promoting my family. So yeah, it's, it's VincePapali.com. It's really simple. So, you know, uh, it, I'm, I'm easy to get a hold of. And, you know, when, when people contact me that way, uh, they don't get an agent. They don't get a, you know, they don't get a handler. Uh, they get, they get this guy right here. And that's how we got you. We'll leave you on this. The t-shirt, explain the t-shirt. All right, here's a t-shirt, you know, who's nuts, right? So if he made a big play, Kenny Iman was our special teams coach. He played about, I don't know, 100 years St. Louis Cardinals as the center. And he was our special teams coach. So he came up with this thing that they had at St. Louis called Who's Nuts International. And he came up with this thing called Who's Nuts. If he made a big play, for example, in the movie, that last play, I got a Who's Nuts t-shirt for that hit that I put on that guy. I didn't get a game ball. I got a Who's Nuts t-shirt, and these Who's Nuts t-shirts were more valuable than game balls. You couldn't put a price tag on those suckers. And uh, I got but that's what it's all about. And we, we call ourselves the Who's Nuts squad. But, but, you know, you can get them. You go to my website. It's, you know, it's Who's Nuts Invincible. We, we put the little invincible thing. But, uh, yeah, it, it's there, and, it, and it's pretty cool. And if I, uh, Janet, ironically, today, she went out for her walk around here, and she's got her Who's Nuts t-shirt on, too. <laughs> So that, that's what it's all about. It's a lot of fun and, and uh, you know, it's a, it's a great fraternity. And, you know, and also I have a, um, w one thing I like to, because, you know, this honors, this honors my, my best friend and the godfather of my children. That's Dennis. I lost Dennis. After, uh, after I, I made a big play, uh, they took a picture, a black and white picture, and, um, and it won an award, and it was called The Last Laugh in that picture right now. And I cannot wait for this because it's in the Pro Football Hall of Fame. And uh, and it's there. If you go, if you, if you go last laugh, Vince Papali, you can find it on Google. And I can't wait to go there when the induction ceremony is going on and see coach and go there with my family and get that get my family picture in front of this. And, and also honoring a, a, a guy that, that taught me how to do it. We were told that we were too. He was too small from Michigan. I was too old from Interboro. And uh, we got the last laugh, so it, it's pretty cool. It's a, it's, it's a great story about how it was done and other people uh, buying into it that are very, very famous. So we had a great time. Well, well Vince, the, the movie was incredible, but hearing it from you is amazing. And I can't thank you enough for spending some time with us here today. I enjoyed meeting you and, and talking with you and, and wish you nothing but the best with your motivational speaking. And enjoy your time with Coach Vermeil, the rest of your teammates. You're going to have a great summer. Oh, I'm going to have a great time. There's a lot of stuff going on, and hopefully I'll be in Canton, Ohio for the playoffs with the USFL. The, uh, the Bandits, if they win these next two games, they're going to be in the playoffs, and that, that, that is going to be absolutely insane. So, you know, just chase that dream. Dream big, chase the dream, and, and win the day. Get through the day, get momentum, and who knows what tomorrow's going to bring you. So you just got to – and surround yourself with a great team and be married to a Janet Cantwell like I am. There so, you go. Yeah, right. words of great wisdom from uh, yeah. Vince Papali. I got. I have to say that. I have to get that one on the record. <laughs> You're a smart man in many regards. Yes, yes you are. I, yes, right. Yeah. 
Wow, great stuff there from Vince Papali. So many insights, so many things that maybe you didn't see in that movie, Invincible, so successful as a movie, but we get the inside scoop from the man himself, Vince Papali, the oldest rookie in the NFL. We thank you for watching. We thank him for being our guest and also Glenn McNow for helping us connect with Vince as well. As always, more great guests coming up. Be sure to subscribe. Be sure to like these episodes as well. You do not want to miss anything else that we have coming up, some big ones coming up on the horizon in the front row. So hopefully you'll join us and again, subscribe to our YouTube channel. Thanks for joining us here once again. More to come next week in the front row with Mike Vaccaro. Have a great day, everybody.